James Ivers, and I'm here today to tell you about the Untangling the Knot research project. The essence of the knot is to build a prototype that helps organizations more quickly evolve their software in several common use cases. This project is in its second of three years, so along the way I'll show you some of the results that we've already achieved uh, and some of the possible uses of the tool even today. Uh, the motivation for this project comes from two really, really pervasive uh, observations in our experience. Uh, the first is that, that no significant system gets built today without software. It is just such, such an important building material for anything that we do, that our ability to work with software is truly important. Uh, it affects project cost, time to field, and so on and so forth. We also know from decades of successful work in software architecture here at the SEI that architecture can be a really good indicator of how easy software is to work with. Architectures that are well aligned with the needs of the software that we're working on, of course, uh, account for, for rapid change and the ability to innovate quickly. Architectures that become misaligned with software tend to have the opposite effect. They can delay progress and in fact sometimes uh, act as outright obstacles to making progress and making changes to software. The other really essential observation that we have is that good software is never done. A system that is successful will be used over and over again for years, if not decades. And over time, change is the real constant. We know that requirements will be added. Business priorities will change. Our technology landscape will change as we move software to new platforms we weren't thinking of 10 years ago. All of these changes are helped or hindered by how well the architecture of our software matches today's needs. And unfortunately, over time, the ideal design of a piece of software will drift from its actual design because we're asking it to do all kinds of things it was never intended to do. This growing gap can cause a lot of difficulties for organizations. It can mean software is very hard to change. It's error prone in terms of lots of defects are introduced when trying to change it or it's just very, very expensive to do things that should be very simple. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as technical debt. Sometimes it's simply a change in purpose. Either way, in order to keep our software as an efficient building material, something that we can innovate in quickly, we need to periodically bridge this gap. We need to bring the architecture back in line with today's needs. And that means restructuring the software. And so that's where untangling the knot comes in. The status quo for how people restructure software today is through a practice called refactoring. Refactoring is very widely known in industry, but is largely a labor intensive process through which a team of developers can have to sort through hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lines of code to figure out where changes are needed and then sort through dozens of options for how to refactor the code and then realize all of those changes in code. What we're trying to do with untangling the knot is to create an automated assistant that automates most of these labor intensive activities. Uh, and if you look to the bottom here uh, at a black box perspective, we really require two inputs. We need the source code that we're trying to improve and we need a notion of the kind of goal, the kind of refactoring, restructuring you're trying to achieve with that code. Given those two things, our goal is for our assistant to be able to accomplish those changes in code in less than a third of the time it would take through manual approaches. And to start this work, we have um, zeroed in on a really important recurring problem that we call feature isolation. You can think of this essentially as lots of different changes in software that require you to first take a piece of software and isolate it from the software around it. For example, if you're trying to containerize something or uh, deploy it as an independent service in the cloud, you first have to decouple it to some degree from the things uh, it was previously coupled to. That's the feature isolation problem that we're tackling with the knot. So as a way to explain some of the use cases, I'm going to go through three categories of ways that it can be used and how it can help organizations at different points in their own decision cycle uh, and at different points of maturity of the tool. The first we consider as an analysis activity. Uh, that is, there are lots of times where an organization wants to uh, incorporate a new technology or interact with a new system, but doing so, they first have to do some basic activities. Uh, and a good example of this uh, is, comes from an example from a government uh, organization we worked with a couple of years ago. They wanted to take a successful capability from one platform and just use it on another. 
Conceptually, this sounds like a pretty simple idea. Take a good thing, use it somewhere else. Well, they asked their contractor, how much will it cost to do that? The contractor did their due diligence and they came back with an estimate of 14,000 development hours, 14,000, just to decouple it from its original context. Uh, and a very good question for anyone to ask is, is that a reasonable estimate? Well, the upfront portion of our refactoring assistant can help you answer that question. Uh, because we take the source code in and we have a notion of a goal, for example, what is this capability you're trying to rehost to a new platform? We go through the analysis to generate lots of data that tells you what specific portions of code are affected by that change. Uh, so rather than basing uh, a cost estimate on a simple notion like what's the total lines of code in the project, we can really narrow, narrow that down to the specific code that is affected by the goal you're trying to accomplish. And it gives you a lot of granularity in this kind of analysis. Uh, you can imagine doing a similar thing at a portfolio level. Uh, certainly no program has the budget for all the modernization activities they would like to perform or all the innovation they'd like to enable. But by using this kind of analysis across the portfolio, you can quickly help rack and stack which of these are more feasible from a technical perspective because less effort is going to be required for those uh, initial steps to, to isolate features. So this is a really important capability, uh, and this really speaks to sort of a project management notion of how do I understand what I'm doing and what the implications are for a change that my technical teams want to do. But we also have help for our technical teams uh, because as part of many modernization activities, there's a natural analysis of alternatives approach. Developers look at lots of different designs. They weigh the pros and cons against multiple criteria. And this, this is wonderful. Uh, what we think we can do with the knot is we can add automation support for adding another criteria to that analysis. So take, uh, for example, a common example today of breaking up legacy monolithic applications uh, to deploy as services or microservices in the cloud. Uh, this involves a range of different decisions about how you take existing functionality and partition it across some number of services or microservices. With the knot, what we can offer development teams is an ability to quickly sketch several different decompositions that they're considering and get that same analysis I talked about in the last slide, which tells you what's the relative difficulty of partitioning your software in one way versus another. So all of this really gives teams a way to to solve their problems, uh, to find the implications of a solution they're proposing to their system because they know what kinds of changes make a lot of sense. But the real power from the knot comes in the third category, and that is we want to go beyond, not just uh, go beyond what are the impediments to change, what are the issues that are going to factor in that cost estimate, but we want to recommend a solution. And in fact, the prototype does that now and is growing in capability in this area. So essentially think of it as I have this the same scenario. There is this capability I want to isolate from its environment in one hardware platform so I can rehost it on another. What the automated refactoring in our tool does is it builds a model of the software and it searches for lots of different combinations of changes to the software, lots of different places in the code to refactor, lots of different refactorings to, or, to apply, and in lots of different orders. And because this is an automated thing, it can search for just a number of possibilities no development team would ever have the, the time uh, to consider for themselves. And the output is a specific recommendation, which is very, very concrete. It is a specific set of steps of changes to the code in a language that engineers understand really well and can independently verify prior to applying to their code. So if you want to take this capability and put it in a container, it will give you a list, list of say, these 60 steps are what you need to go through and look for yourself, confirm this, and then implement it. So this is where the just tremendous opportunity is to save time. It's uh, an option to explore many, many more solutions than development teams can explore manually, which also hopefully lead to better solutions. The, the key concept behind this is framing this as an optimization problem. That's what allows us to turn search algorithms loose to look for solutions that we might have missed or even to find those that we might have found much more efficiently. Um, so if you take an arbitrary piece of code, we know there is structure in the code. We, it's not an undifferentiated mess. Uh, 
Uh, and so the illustration we have here is a small piece of open source software where we've applied some semantic knowledge to what the code is, what it means. Classes are this color, methods are this color, uh, and there are different sorts of dependencies among all of these entities and relations. But to think about what it means to, to harvest a feature, to take it and, and move it somewhere else. Suppose that this portion of code in the upper left is what we want to isolate, what we want to harvest as a reusable feature. Well, we know from our knowledge as architects that not all data in this picture is relevant to that problem. And that's an important insight. It gives us tractability. Uh, we know, for example, that all the dependencies between code that's not part of that unit, they're not getting in the way of harvesting that piece of code. Relationships within this code, well, those really aren't all that important either because they're all going to the same new location together. What really, really matters are these red lines, which we call problematic couplings. They are dependencies from the code that we're harvesting to the code that won't be present in a new context. Each and every one of these couplings is a dependency that will break and a reason why that harvest operation will not be successfully completed. Because we can construct these graph representations from source code automatically, we can compute these relations very efficiently. We can enumerate each and every one of these problematic couplings, which feeds the analysis of where the problems are very specifically. Uh, and because this is countable, this gives us a basis for something called a fitness function, which is a way to compare one change to a graph to another change to determine which is better against that criteria. And that key insight allows us to turn search algorithms loose to find solutions to get rid of as many of these red lines as possible, therefore saving our developers tons and tons of time chasing down all those threads themselves in potentially very, very large code bases. So if we step back and look at this from an end user perspective, if we take a look at those first two scenarios, where we're trying to analyze a problem and understand the difficulty of a change we're trying to make. We start with this source code and we've tested our, uh, our prototype on more than a million lines of source code. Um, given that source code and a little bit of help from a developer in a very simple way to identify what is the code that you're trying to isolate, once those two steps are given to us by a user, the rest can be done by our tool automatically. It can go through and enumerate, for example, in this million line of code example, that there are more than 2000 problematic couplings getting in the way. And we can report lots and lots of data. We can point to the lines of code on each end of every one of those dependencies. We can identify all the classes involved, all the methods of those classes that are involved. And we can distill that information into some pretty useful stuff, right? So from these 2000 problematic couplings, we can determine there are really only 144 unique targets just by lining up the names, something that a very simple analysis can do quickly. With just a little bit more work, we quickly determined that all of these things like methods and properties, they're elements of classes. If we consolidate that information and just look for the unique classes, then with about 10 minutes of work using our tool, we go from a million line code problem to understanding that only these 24 classes are where we need to focus our attention. And that is tremendous advantage in terms of focusing developer attention on what matters instead of trying to figure out what matters. But as we step ahead to the refactoring end of the tool, we have the same precursor steps. We still need the source code. We still need the problem that we're trying to solve. But now we need to say a little bit more. We need to say something about the characteristics of the solution that are important to us. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in a couple of slides, but this comes down to identifying multiple objectives that we care about. Because we know as architects and software developers that a lot of what we do, the really hard stuff, is making trade-off decisions. I have to give a little performance here to get a little security there. We understand those changes. And as part of what we're doing, we're using a multi-objective genetic algorithm to search for solutions that give developers insights into those trade-offs and give them a range of solutions that reflect different balances of those trade-offs so that they can select a solution that meets their context as opposed to some just arbitrary best answer. So when using the tool, provide the same input, give us a little guidance on the objectives, and at the end of the day, pick a solution on the curb that matches your area of interest, your desired trade-offs, and the tool will give you a solution. And that solution looks like this on the left. Uh, it is a simple step-by-step -step process for how to refactor the code. It's very easy to follow uh, because it uses a vocabulary that developers are familiar with. Moving a property, moving a class, moving a method, 
uh, encapsulating a field. These are very familiar concepts, which makes it easy for developers to review. We can also look at the data that goes along with this. Uh, in that case of the, the million line code project where we had 2000 problematic couplings, we found a really interesting insight that after just the first six refactorings, more than 90% of the problem was solved. And so this gives developers that additional insight to know where the big wins are quickly so that they can focus on the easy stuff. And then maybe where the tool gets in diminishing returns, maybe they wanna take over from the assistant and do the hard bit themselves because it's getting a little bit murkier. This notion of an automated assistant that gives you a partial answer allows that give and take with the developer. It gives them enough control to trust the answers and to understand everything that the tool is doing. And we believe that this will be a big asset in accepting the results and putting them into practice. But again, I wanna say a little bit more about multiple criteria because this is very important to any, any real solution. Um, at the end of the day, we have to generate solutions that developers will accept. And so to do that, we've been talking to developers to understand different criteria. And you'll see here uh, a few examples of what those look like. There's the solution to the core isolation problem. This is minimizing problematic coupling. That's, that's pretty obvious by now. But there are other things that developers care about. They wanna minimize the work that they're gonna to have to do after the refactoring assistant is done. So one way to think about this is the more classes that we muck with, the more invasive the refactoring is, the more pieces of code might have to go back through code inspection or might have to have unit tests rewritten. So there are ways to use different criteria to minimize those sorts of invasive changes. We can also look at typical code quality metrics to make sure that we have a more maintainable result when we're done, that code is understandable, and that we're not introducing vulnerabilities by, by overexposing the information available in the RAPIs. There's a range of these things that we're looking at to understand from a qualitative perspective, perspective what do developers care about? But on the back end, we mirror this with good old statistical analysis to make sure that all of those different functions that we're looking at are actually measuring different underlying phenomena. And while you can't read the, the individual labels on, on any of these uh, particular fitness functions, each fitness function measure being a measure for one objective, you can see that some correlate re really highly and you're maybe not really measuring such different things. And so we're doing this kind of analysis both on the front end by talking with developers and on the back end by running the, running the data uh, to see what is that good, good compromise. What are the good fitness functions that differentiate solutions for us, get us more of that trade-off space without uh, wasting a lot of computational time because the more objectives we add to search, the more computationally expensive it can get. But at the end of the day, we get this notion of a range of solutions that are good for developers. Uh, and this relies on a notion called Pareto optimality. Uh, essentially, uh, what this means is that if we look at a two objective solution, in this case, problematic couplings and lines of code, in this case, we're really trying to minimize both measures, right? We're trying to get down towards the origins being the, the best possible solution, right? Uh, the best possible solution in this case would solve all the problematic couplings without adding a single line of code. It's, it's unrealistic, but we can dream. Uh, but what we see is that as we run the search, Pareto optimality collects a range of solutions that don't clearly dominate each other. They reflect that give and take that developers understand from the trade-off space. We have a range of solutions at this end of the spectrum that really solve most of the problematic couplings, but at the cost of adding more code. At the opposite end, we've got uh, solutions that add very, very little code to the original feature, but you know, they don't solve a whole lot of the problem. We have compromised solutions in the middle. Um, and this really gives us an ability to talk to developers in their language, to understand their context and give them some choice about which of these solutions to look at. And that's really important. But behind the scenes, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have time in today's talk to go into this as much as I would love to, uh, we're in the realm of metaheuristics. Uh, genetic algorithms have a whole bunch of parameters that we can tune to get to better solutions, to converge to solutions more quickly. And we are running thousands and thousands of experiments behind the scenes to tune these parameters to solve this sort of problem across a range of different code bases. And this illustration is, is a simple one. Again, the, the axis here is problematic couplings. Fewer are better. What we're varying here is a, is a very straightforward parameter. How many generations are we running through that genetic algorithm? These, these are the iterations of search, right? And so the fewer iterations have uh, less reduction in problematic coupling. The more we run, the better our solutions are and the more they converge towards better solutions. This 
this is not a terribly significant uh, or surprising result. But we're doing this across all of these parameters to tune the algorithm to the nature of the problem that we have because it has its own intrinsic characteristics. But let me step back and say where we are right now. As I said earlier, we're at the end of year two. And so we've got a working prototype that we can apply today to C-sharp code bases to solve those first two categories of scenarios that I talked about. We'd say those are, are TRL4 capability. The automating refactoring is, is not falling far behind. Uh, we're currently in trials where we are comparing the results of manually refactored code to what the tool recommends in getting expert developers to give us their feedback on the tool to help us hone the algorithm, hone those fitness functions, and generate better and better solutions. We're expecting that portion of the tool to be at the, the TRL pilot ready phase in maybe three to six months. Um, and so this, this is really encouraging. We have working code, we're happy to solve problems, and we're eagerly looking for partners to try this on. Um, our prerequisites are pretty simple. We need source code and we need a semantic idea of what you're trying to accomplish. What's the feature you're trying to reuse or package or in a container or something like that. Right now, everything is targeting C-sharp code bases, which we've tested up to about 1.2 million lines of code. Uh, but Java capability is not that far behind. And so if that's, that's your, uh, your working environment, please reach out to us anyway, because I think we, we have some potential there to, to engage. Um, but stepping way, way back, uh, this is part of the SEI vision to really improve the automation that's available to architects and designers and developers and to tackle these really significant problems that tend to be addressed manually today, right? I talked earlier about the gap that tends to emerge between the software that we have and the structure we really like. What the knot really is, is this drastic, efficient intervention to bring those more in line very, very quickly. And this is part of our efforts to use AI to solve software engineering problems and really improve the capability that development teams have so they can focus more on innovation than refactoring code. And if this is of interest to you, please reach out and thank you very much for listening today.